burning his bones. That's going to be, God willing, our second class. The, the record goes on to Moses, our third class for the day. Uh, and we'll certainly be getting into that a little while from now. Um, tomorrow, uh, as you can see, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll finish with our final class. All being well, looking at Ruth, uh, another wonderful example of faith, a real pilgrim, uh, certainly uh, in her life. So th this is the program. I think there's so much that we can take from each of these characters. We could have quite easily filled uh, a weekend with any one of them, but I hope that what we do will uh, at least open the scriptures to us all uh, and give us opportunity to reflect importantly on our lives. In each case, I've tried to uh, pull out a key point uh, that we're going to learn from each of these characters. So with Abraham first, it's about the principles. What does it mean to be a pilgrim? Uh, it is, of course, a, a Bible definition that we're looking for today. We read it there, didn't we, again, in that introductory reading there in the Hebrews, uh, that these were strangers and pilgrims. So in our first talk, we'll look using Abraham as our template, as our example, at what it means to be a pilgrim. Not a dictionary definition, but a Bible definition. Uh, and we're going to see how his life was a pilgrimage. Now, of course, in a simple way, you can think about him as a pilgrim and that he left her and he journeyed. He lived in a tent. Uh, he was, in very real terms, a stranger and pilgrim. But what we're going to see together uh, is that actually there's something more important in terms of Abraham being a pilgrim. Yes, he did go on a journey. Yes, he did uh, leave her behind and go live in a tent. Uh, but what made him a pilgrim, as we'll see, is much more than that. We get then in our second class uh, with Joseph there, to his great grandson, of course. Uh, and what we're going to see here is that Joseph's life, uh, in the traditional sense of uh, being a pilgrim, wasn't a pilgrimage at all. Uh, he lived for a relatively short part of his life in Israel. Uh, there was some movement there with his uh, father, Jacob. But the majority of his life, his adult life, was lived out, of course, in Egypt. Uh, so not in the traditional sense of pilgrim, but as we'll see, everything that we've learned about Abraham uh, absolutely applied to his great grandson, Joseph, who had that same pilgrim mindset. And in this class, we're going to learn about a pilgrim in trial, because this is what Joseph's life was for a substantial proportion of it and how he uh, applied his faith, applied the principles of being a pilgrim, even though for part of his life, he couldn't walk at all uh, when he was shut up in that Egyptian prison. So Moses uh, then comes next. And here, I particularly want us to focus on the influence that we can have as pilgrims. We lay out the principles with Abraham. We see them apply, particularly in trial with Joseph. Uh, and then we come to Moses, who, of course, himself also had that same mindset, that same mindset of faith uh, that we've already seen with Abraham and with Joseph. But we particularly want to call out here how that impacted upon the ecclesia. Uh, it's one thing for you or I to choose the pilgrim life, to try to live by faith uh, and to do that for ourselves and for our families, because it's what we believe is right. Uh, but what we'll see in this class with Moses is that actually by doing that, we can have an enormous influence on our brothers and sisters, on the ecclesia, uh, as he did. Of course, all of this leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we felt it was fitting with the exhortation tomorrow, God willing, uh, to think about the pilgrim's captain, the author uh, and finisher of faith. Uh, and we'll spend some time with him, God willing, tomorrow morning. Uh, and then finally with Ruth, we bring it to a close by showing that really every pilgrim has a decision to make. Ruth did. She made the right decision. She'll be in the kingdom. Uh, and I think we've got a lot to learn from her in that last class, all being well tomorrow. So pilgrims then in a post-faith age. We could have even called it pilgrims in New York. This is where many of you are today. And, you know, it's ironic, isn't it? If you take that dictionary definition uh, of being a pilgrim, we'll come on to that in just a moment. In some ways, living in New York couldn't be further from the idea of being a pilgrim. You think about someone on a journey. Uh, you think about Abraham in a tent. You are not in that situation today in New York. If you're dialed in from somewhere else uh, across the world, the likelihood is you're not either. And certainly we living down here in Northern Virginia, just outside Washington, DC. Our lives are not pilgrimages in the traditional sense, but God calls on us. Even if we live in one of the world's great cities as New York is to be 
pilgrims. So we need to understand what that means together. There's that dictionary definition. Uh, the, the dictionary will tell us that a pilgrim is someone who journeys to a sacred place for religious reasons. And you can think about people taking a pilgrimage. And as we say, Abraham's life to an extent in that traditional sense was a pilgrimage. He had to uh, go from Ur of the Chaldees and live in a tent for the rest of his days. But, but when the scripture summarizes his life, while it talks about his faith in leaving Ur, uh, it indicates to us that there's something more about being a pilgrim than just going on a journey. Uh, and you can see it on the screen here. We read it, didn't we, in that introductory reading together. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So you're already getting from that verse there some of the ideas of being a pilgrim. Uh, and we're going to use Abraham, uh, as I say in our first class here, to really lay out for us what it means scripturally to be a pilgrim. So let's go then to uh, Abraham, uh, to, uh, to our first class. We've taken uh, that phrase there from Hebrews that he looked for a city which hath foundations. Uh, and as we'll see, one of the principles that we're going to develop today with Abraham is this faith, this vision, this vision for the future, this desire for the kingdom. Uh, this is indeed one of the pilgrim principles that we're looking to establish together. And I think you can find them very simply uh, right back here in the Genesis record. We first uh, hear of Abraham, of course, just one chapter earlier, back in uh, Genesis 11. We get that genealogy there, don't we? We learn about the, uh, the generation through uh, from the flood to Abraham. And then we, of course, come into chapter 12, which is, if you like, the traditional start of the story of Abraham with those promises in those opening verses that we know so well. And I suggest to you that in this first verse here, uh, we've got laid out in many ways the pilgrim principles that we want to share together in this class. And we've highlighted them then there for you uh, in, uh, we've highlighted them there for you in the verse. So three things then. The Lord had said unto Abraham, get thee out uh, of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So these then are the three pilgrim principles that we want to develop in the class here together this morning. The first one is you have to get out. Abraham, you have to leave Ur of the Chaldees behind. Uh, and we'll have a look at what it was scripturally that Abraham was asked to leave behind. The first step is one of separation. It is one of withdrawal, of coming out of the world. Uh, and as we say, you can be a pilgrim in New York City, living uh, and functioning in the city, but you can't be of New York City. That can't be your heritage. If you want to be a pilgrim, you have to be separate. So let's go and understand what that means scripturally. The second thing we take from that first verse there in uh, Genesis 12 is that you're not just separating to then be somewhere in the wilderness. You have a vision. You have faith. You have focus. You are going unto a land. Uh, and it's interesting, isn't it? As we read that Hebrews um, uh, record together, he didn't actually know initially where he was going. Uh, so I suggest to you it wasn't so much ultimately about the land in this life. The vision went beyond this life. It went beyond resurrection. Uh, it went to the kingdom. Uh, he looked for an heavenly, uh, which was better. Uh, those are some of the phrases that were used there in that Hebrews passage that we took. So while the kingdom of God on earth is, of course, a, a critical part of the pilgrim vision, and we'll show you that from the scriptures, it wasn't so much about how he could, in this life, make a journey to get to a particular place. Uh, it was about a vision for eternity. Uh, and this is what we hope to uh, see together again from the scriptures this morning. The third and I think very important part uh, of the pilgrim principles is that God promises in that first verse there to show Abraham the land. You know, he's not sending him off to go on a journey, hoping that he gets there. Rather, what he's saying is, I'm going to show you. The pilgrim principles are about journeying with God. This is about a relationship with our heavenly father. So yes, there's something we need to leave behind, but what have we got to look forward to and who 
have we got to walk with? It is indeed the God of all the earth. Just to uh, align those with the passage that we read there in Hebrews, get out, God said. And uh, this is exactly what Abraham did. Uh, and in that Hebrews reading we took there, uh, I, the very nice verse there, verse 15, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. In other words, Abraham could have chosen to go back to the era of the Chaldees, or he could have retreated back to Haran, uh, but he didn't because he'd gotten out on the command of God, and it was a lifetime commitment to that pilgrimage that he went on to take with God from that day. So getting out, uh, part one for Abraham. Unto a land, we've already touched on this. Uh, the, the next verse in the Hebrews record there, Hebrews 11, verse 16, uh, he could have gone back to Ur of the Chaldees. Why didn't he? Now they desire a better country. He wanted something better than what the Ur of the Chaldees had to offer. Uh, they desire a better country that is an heavenly, uh, it tells us. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, uh, for he hath prepared for them a city. And so as we look into this, we'll see, of course, that this heavenly vision that Abraham has uh, ultimately leads to uh, a kingdom on earth. That is the better country that God has promised to all those who follow these pilgrim principles in their lives. Uh, and then finally, uh, that idea that came out of Genesis 12, 1, that God would show him the land, that God would walk with him to the land, that his pilgrimage uh, was a thing of relationship with his heavenly father comes out here, doesn't it, too, in the Hebrews record as well. Uh, wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God associates himself uh, with those who take on these pilgrim principles, with those who live lives of faith. So to try to distill this down then, here are the three pilgrim principles which we've established together, both from the Genesis record, but also from that reading that we took together in Hebrews, those well-known words from Hebrews 11, it is about separation. We can't, as we're going to go on to see through these classes, we can't live a life now and in the future. We have to uh, be focused on the things of God. Uh, we can't indoctrinate ourselves with the things of the world and try at the same time to take into ourselves the heavenly things uh, of God's scriptures. We have to be separate from the world in which we live it's also then about moving forward. It's about having faith. I, I, I really pondered whether to use the word faith or to use the word vision there. Uh, to have clear focus and vision for the future because of the faith that you have in the things of God. The, uh, the things, as we read again in our Hebrews reading there, the things uh, concerning him that we believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Uh, having that vision as Abraham and these others uh, of faith did. Uh, that God would indeed establish a kingdom on earth. And he sought that as something which he passionately believed was better than the things that were on offer in this life. And of course, that relationship uh, with God, uh, so, so critical. Uh, it's not about uh, a bad life now for the future, though, as we're going to see uh, in the class uh, on Joseph, that of course, there can be trials in, in, in certain cases, as in Joseph's case, severe trials. Uh, but it's uh, it's not about a bad life now for a reward in the future. I think somehow that's how Christianity is perceived. It's about blessings now and for the life to come. The blessings of a relationship with God as you journey with him uh, to the sure and certain promises uh, of the kingdom. Okay, so let's start then with having a look at what it was that Abraham needed to separate from. Get thee out, uh, God said to him, first of all, separate yourself. Uh, and we'll go through this, I think, at quite a canter. The verses are up on the screen. Uh, of course, if you're taking notes, you can put them down. We do have a Q&A a little bit later on, all being well. So if anything's missed, uh, of course, please feel free to note that down and we can certainly pick it up in discussion together. So, um, of course, we know that he came out of the era of the cold Chaldees and this was stressed by Stephen in his speech in Acts 7. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, uh, and then a little later, then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans. Uh, and you can see on the map there, down in the bottom right corner, that area of Chaldea, uh, Babylon, of course, is there. 
And you can see the route he took up that uh, fertile crescent there up towards Heron at the top before coming down into the land. But the point that we want to take from this is that, the, that he was coming out of the land of the Chaldeans, or of the Chaldees, same idea. And as you can see, Babylon's right there, the Babylonian culture, the Chaldean culture, as we're going to show you uh, effectively, were one and the same thing. So there's Stephen uh, in Acts 7 reminding us that God called Abraham from Chaldea, from Babylon. Uh, and let's understand scripturally then what that means. So the idea, as we say, that the Chaldean culture that he was called from is the Babylonian culture, I think it is abundantly clear. Uh, of course, you can see the geography there that Babylon and Chaldea uh, are right there in that same place uh, from where he came. Uh, and as we go into uh, the record in Daniel, uh, and of course, we know the story well, the young boys there who were taken uh, from Israel and made captive uh, in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar there in Babylon, you can see how uh, he, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, is, of course, reigning. That's Daniel 1, verse 1. Um, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, verse 2, uh, along with the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar. So remember that name, Shinar, that's synonymous with Babylon. Uh, and then uh, down in verse 4, these boys who were taken captive uh, because they had no blemish, they were well favored, they were skillful in wisdom and so on. Uh, they were going to be taught the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. That, what, that's what verse 4 of Daniel 1 tells us. In other words, when you're taken into Babylon, the culture that you're going to learn is a Chaldean culture. Now, obviously, this uh, comes some time after Abraham, uh, but I'd suggest to you that by the time Abraham was called from Ur of the Chaldees, uh, he was being called from the same culture uh, that prevailed at the time of Nebuchadnezzar here in Babylon, uh, and I would suggest to you that culture still uh, prevails today. So this is the culture then that uh, Abraham was called from. Let's go learn from the scriptures a little bit more about it. Well, firstly, uh, here in Joshua 24, quite straightforward, of course, we know that in Babylon there were other gods being served, and this was certainly happening at the time of Abraham. Uh, when Joshua, right at the end of the book, uh, is settling the people down into the land. He speaks to all the people and he says, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So this was the starting point. This is what it was that Abraham was being called from, uh, a family, an environment where they served other gods. Uh, and of course, as we say, the culture was one uh, of Babylonian worship, of Chaldean worship uh, in its earliest sense. In terms of origins, uh, of course, this starts even earlier. It starts with Nimrod. Uh, and in the genealogies there, this man is called out, isn't he? Uh, Cush begat Nimrod, we learn in Genesis 10. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel in the land of Shinar. We've already seen the land of Shinar. That was there uh, at the beginning of Daniel, wasn't it? It's the area uh, in which Babylon, uh, of course, existed. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, uh, which became, uh, of course, Babylon. Uh, the spirit that Nimrod had was that he was uh, against or in the face of the Lord. That's what that word there really means. Uh, it's not suggesting that he was one of God's mighty hunters, but rather he was in the face of God. He was against God. He uh, was building uh, Babel in the land of Shinar. Uh, and you can see that spirit in uh, Genesis 11 as uh, the people there set about to build the Tower uh, of Babel. Uh, you can see where the focus is very clearly. The scriptures uh, don't hide it, do they? Let us build us uh, a city. Let us make us uh, a name. And I suggest to you that this is the spirit of Babel, the spirit of Babylon, uh, the spirit of Chaldea from which Abraham was called, that we want to do it for ourselves, that we uh, are important, uh, that it's our name uh, that we want to preserve. This is the spirit of Babylon uh, from which Abraham was called. Uh, and of course, uh, that spirit, as we say, continues. Uh, it's there back in Genesis 10 and 11 with Nimrod, 
uh, and with the Tower of Babel. It's clearly here uh, at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you might remember, of course, that he had the dream in, in Daniel 2 of the image. And God very clearly lays out in prophetic terms exactly what he's going to do with the kingdom of men, that one kingdom would rise up after another until eventually, uh, of course, uh, the Lord God himself would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. Uh, and it, it's interesting, isn't it, how Nebuchadnezzar re reacts to this. It, it seems initially positively, uh, but just verses later in chapter three, uh, he's here in the face of God. God said, this is what's going to happen. You know, there will be one kingdom and after another until uh, I set up a kingdom. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar says, no, Babylon's never going away. He made his image purely of gold. Uh, he made this gigantic statue. He put it up uh, there uh, on the plains near Babylon, uh, and he called for all people to bow down to it. Uh, and you might remember those three faithful men who have stood there, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we will not bow down to your image. We will not worship your gods. So here is the spirit of Babylon, alive and kicking at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, as you would expect it to be there in Babylon, in the face of God, against God, uh, human pride, human haughtiness, a disregard for the sure and certain word of God. Well, at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, then, uh, we'd suggest to you that this spirit is still absolutely there. This idea of being against God. Uh, Psalm 2 illustrates this very clearly for us, doesn't it? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Uh, so at the time of Jesus Christ, this spirit was there. It was there in the Roman rule of the day, but it had also heavily infiltrated uh, into uh, the religious leadership in Israel at the time. Uh, the kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers took counsel together against God, against his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and this is picked up in the teaching of the apostles uh, in the Acts, very clearly, of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. Uh, all of these came together against the Son of God, uh, and there was the spirit of Babylon alive at that time. And it tells us that, you know, in going against Jesus, Pilate and Herod came together as friends. There's a joining together. Uh, of people against God and against his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as they crucified him. This is that same spirit of Babylon uh, that was alive then at the time of Jesus Christ. Uh, and let's bring it to today, um, as Peter instructs, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Spirit of Babylon, my dear brothers and sisters, has been there from the time of Nimrod, even the time of Cain, all the way through uh, to the age in which we live today. And what did God say to Abraham? Get thee out. Uh, and, you know, here's where it's heading. This is where the spirit of Babylon, the kingdom of men, uh, is going. Uh, here's physical Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees excellency. It shall be, uh, the prophet says, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. And you know, you can think of many ancient cities which still exist today. You can still go and visit Rome. Uh, you can go to Jerusalem. Uh, if the border wasn't closed, you could go to Damascus. You can't go to the city of Babylon because God has followed through on his prophecy. If this is the end of physical Babylon, then so too spiritual Babylon. Uh, as the Lord Jesus Christ himself instructed in the revelation, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Come out of her, my people. What did God say to Abraham? Get thee out. Come out of that Chaldean culture. Come out of that Babylonian culture. 
uh, and come with me to the land of promise. It is exactly the same call here from the Lord Jesus Christ to all his faithful. We need to leave behind the spirit of the age and we need to, as pilgrims, focus our vision on the kingdom of God and walk with God on the way to life. So clearly then, uh, that first principle, you have to separate yourself. And as we'll see through these classes, in terms of their physical living conditions, uh, there were pilgrims in all sorts of different places and statuses. Abraham, if you like, more traditionally a pilgrim, uh, a stranger walking, uh, living in a tent. But others, like Joseph, as we've already referenced, they're in Egypt, like Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah in Babylon. You can be a pilgrim uh, in any setting if your mindset is the right one. And the first part of the mindset has to be separation from the spirit of the age. So when we talk about pilgrims in a post-faith age, as I say, it's not for me today to sit here and give my own view on the world that we live in. You all experience that yourselves. You all live in it in one sense or another. The very clear call of the Bible uh, of our God is to separate, is to get out. Uh, and as we know, it's not about doing that necessarily physically. It, it was for Abraham, but it's absolutely about doing it in our minds uh, and in our hearts. Well, as I say, God doesn't want us just to separate to then uh, have no purpose, but rather uh, there are better things for us. Uh, and of course, uh, we're now looking at that with this idea of having faith, having a vision, uh, heading towards the land. So let's then turn to Abraham and let's see how he uh, had faith, had a vision. Um, uh, as he got out of Ur of the Chaldees, as he escaped from that Babylonian culture where they worshipped other gods, the spirit of let us build us a city was replaced by something. He looked for a city, we read in Hebrews, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So if the spirit of the ages let me do it for me, let us do it for us. Abraham's attitude was, I want something better. I want something that has foundations. I want something that is from God. So there's the contrast between the spirit of Babylon and the mind of faith, replacing what I can do for me with what we together can do with our God. What was the other thing that was there in Genesis 11? It's let us make us a name. And again, uh, the scriptures call out for us a very clear contrast, don't, don't we? Uh, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Words there, of course, from Moses uh, at the burning bush. So God has taken his name and effectively put it on Abraham. Uh, look at what he's calling himself, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Uh, and what that's showing you is it's not just for Abraham, but it's for his seed as well, ultimately, as the New Testament uh, teaches us. And we can learn it, of course, from the old as well. Uh, it is all those who are of faith. God puts his name on his faithful. So again, there's a contrast, isn't there? Do you want the city that you can build? Uh, or do you want to look for a better city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God? Do you want to make a name for yourself? Or are you looking to have God's name put upon you? And he's shown his willingness to do it with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, uh, with many more, some of whom will study together uh, this weekend. This is my name and his name included the names of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He had effectively put his name, his memorial name on them. Uh, and to convince us uh, that this applies to us too, here's the, the blessing uh, that comes at the end of number six, the end of that chapter on the Nazarite vow. The idea of being a Nazarite, of course, is one of separation. That was the first pilgrim principle that we thought about. You need to get out. A Nazarite was one who separated themselves unto God. Uh, and when you do that, here's the blessing that comes at the end of that chapter. It's sometimes called the ironic blessing. It was uh, given through Aaron and his sons, uh, but you can see they're clearly called out on the slide. They will put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. So God's name was put on Abraham 
and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, and now as we're learning, all those who separate themselves unto God, as the Nazarite did, as the pilgrim does, uh, can take God's name on them. So we're starting to see a contrast and, and, and a choice, aren't we? Uh, do you want to stay in Babylon, stay in Chaldea, stay in the spirit of the age, looking to build for yourself, make a name for yourself? Or do you want to be a pilgrim who walks with God, who looks for a better city, who looks for the name of God to be put on them? Here is the contrast that the scriptures are clearly calling out for us, my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, and that better country uh, that we've referred to, uh, let's just think about that for a moment now, because as Abraham journeyed, as we say initially, he didn't know where he was going. So uh, although the land ultimately becomes important, it's of course part of the promises, uh, his vision went beyond a resting place in this life. Um, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. He was thinking about a better country that is in heavenly. Uh, his vision wasn't for what he could get in this life. Uh, his vision was for something better. His faith uh, was for something stronger. Because when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Uh, the apostle writes, now, of course, as we say, uh, the kingdom of God on earth is, uh, of course, part of that heavenly vision. Uh, the words of the hymn book here, uh, for me, were very pertinent I as I was thinking about this. God has in store for us his heavenly kingdom from which his son on earth shall reign. So Abraham had a, had a heavenly vision. He had a godly vision. Uh, first and foremost, he was thinking about God and his promises and his covenant and his relationship with him and his name. Uh, and then he also understood that part of that relationship, part of the promise uh, was, uh, of course, this inheritance on the earth, but not uh, in, that in the life that he was living, uh, a promise for the future, uh, a promise with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, when he will set up, uh, as we believe, his kingdom on earth. So let's not uh, in any way detract from that part of the vision. There is a land which you will receive, God said to Abraham, Genesis 13, 15, I'll give it to you and to your seed. But as you can see, the promise is forever. This is a promise for the kingdom. This is a promise for eternity. And, and it's interesting uh, that when God made that promise to Abraham, uh, and he believed it, of course, that was uh, something that Abraham really stood out for, wasn't it? His willingness to believe and to trust in God, uh, that the next thing he did was remove his tent and he came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, we're told, which is Hebron, and built there an altar to the Lord. So on receiving that promise of the land, uh, Abraham journeys to Hebron. And of course, it was here uh, that he uh, acquired the cave uh, in the field of Machpelah and buried his wife, Sarah. There, You can see that in Genesis 23, 19, as we've got on the screen there. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And as we go through uh, the Genesis record together, we find that there are many uh, who were buried uh, in that same place. Sarah, of course, as we've already mentioned there, uh, she ultimately in Hebrews 11, uh, as we uh, read, got called out for her faith. Uh, Abraham himself was buried there. Isaac, we learn, uh, was too. Uh, his wife, Rebecca. Leah was buried there. Jacob tells that story and Jacob himself buried there as well. Uh, so Abraham and his seed will inherit uh, the earth, will inherit the land at the moment they sleep in the dust of the earth. And many of the faithful uh, are buried here in Hebron, the place that Abraham went to immediately after receiving that promise. Uh, this is the place from which they will arise uh, to receive the kingdom, God willing, in the future. So to the third and final then of our pilgrim principles, we've thought about the idea of separation, uh, of leaving behind uh, the spirit of the age, the spirit of Babylon, uh, of having a vision uh, for things above, uh, for things that are better, uh, for an heavenly kingdom, uh, which will, of course, be on the earth. 
Uh, the final part then of our first class is to see that God walks with us all the way on this journey. I will show you uh, the land, God said to Abraham. So uh, thinking then about our God and his involvement in our lives, and there's much that we could go through in terms of passages uh, together, uh, looking at how step by step, event by event, God walks with Abraham, helping him, guiding him, encouraging him, admonishing him, uh, helping him become an ever more faithful servant. It starts there in 12 verse 1 with, I will show you the land. We're going on a journey together. Uh, a little later uh, in Genesis 15, uh, when Abraham's really starting to wonder, uh, not a lack of faith, but a, a really a desire for understanding of how the things God has promised him are going to come to pass, considering that he's still at that time remains seedless. And God says to him, uh, he came to him in a vision and he says, fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield uh, and thy exceeding great reward. So as we say, there is a promise of a reward for the future. Uh, we've been thinking about that, the heavenly kingdom uh, from which the Lord Jesus Christ on earth shall reign. But the reward of God starts on our pilgrimage journey now. God is with us now uh, as we journey to the kingdom. I am your shield and I am your reward. God in your life is reward in itself. God walking with you uh, is part of the blessing uh, that you receive as you head on the way to the kingdom. So yes, a life in Christ is one of future hope, a future reward, but it's also absolutely uh, a life that has promise for the life that now is. Uh, and a big part, the central part uh, of that is God himself. He is our exceeding great reward, uh, as he said to Abraham here in Genesis 15, uh, verse 1. He goes on in Genesis 17, as he's changing Abraham's name to Abraham, to emphasize that he will be a God to Abraham. I will be your God. You know, Abraham had left the era of the Chaldees where they worshipped other gods. Uh, and now God is affirming himself as Abraham's God, as Abraham's Elohim, as Abraham's strength. Uh, and in the next verse, he goes on to say, that this applies to Abraham's seed too. I will be an Elohim to you, and I will be Elohim to your seed. God is promising relationship. He's promising support, guidance. Uh, he is your shield and your exceeding great reward, uh, as that 15 verse 1 passage uh, said for us. Uh, and that commitment that God has made is uh, not one for uh, just a journey. You know, you think about Abraham heading from uh, uh, to be shown the land by uh, God. You could think that, you know, as God brings him into the land, he somehow leaves him. Uh, but this isn't the way God presents himself at all. You know, when God uh, was speaking to Abraham's grandson, Jacob, uh, as he fled from his family home uh, and had that, uh, that dream, that vision, as you can see in the illustration there, uh, the words of God were, I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to the of that is genesis 28 verse 15 and we might ask ourselves well what was it uh, that god had promised jacob what were the things that he had spoken to him of as the verse on the screen there says well part of the promise was that he would bring him back to his father's house in peace so again we could think well you know that was a period of time he went off to laban's house he came back some 20 years later and eventually he ended up back with isaac in Hebron. Was that the fulfillment of God's commitment? Well, partially, yes, it was. Uh, but of course, God's commitment went much further. You see, God had spoken to Jacob of other things too, the same things that he spoke to Abraham of. Uh, he spoke to him in the previous verse, Genesis 28, 14, uh, about having a seed that would be as the dust of the earth. Uh, he reiterated the promise of Genesis 12, 3, that in you, Jacob, Israel, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, this is, again, a, a set of promises that go beyond God bringing Jacob back to his family home. It speaks of the kingdom. It speaks of eternity. And let's just see, uh, maybe from one or two other scriptures, uh, how this commitment from our Heavenly Father plays through. You know, if you're thinking about when is it that God gets involved and how long is it going to last? 
Uh, the simple answer, as we see on the screen, is it is from eternity to eternity. But let's just call that out from the scriptures together. So, you know, thinking about when did God get involved in your life, you could go to uh, the psalm there that we've got on the screen. It's Psalm 139. I'm just turning that up here for you. And as the psalmist reflects on God and his commitment and his relationship with him, this is, of course, a psalm of David. Uh, he says, you have possessed my reins. You covered me in my mother's womb. Uh, I will praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. So when did God get involved in Abraham's life? Let's use him as an example. Was it when he first spoke to him there uh, in Ur of the Chaldees before he moved to Haran? No, that wasn't the first time. He knew David. He knew Abraham. He knew you and I from the womb. That's what the psalmist is saying here. Uh, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in countenance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Before I existed, you knew me in the womb, the psalmist says. And Paul, as he writes to the Ecclesia in Ephesus, takes that one step further. And here's where we get this idea of from eternity. Blessed be the Lord, uh, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Ephesians 1 verse 3. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in, in the heavenlies, in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. God knew you from the beginning. True to Abraham, true to David, true to each of us as well. So God's commitment is from everlasting. When uh, Jacob was uh, an old man and dying and speaking with Joseph and blessing Joseph's two sons, he talked about how God had been with him all the days of his life. I'll just read you here again from the verse that you can see on the screen there, Genesis 48, 15. And he blessed, that's he, Israel, Jacob blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. You know, all the way through to the very end of my life, God has been there with me. You know, so when you think about God doing what he promised he would do to Jacob, bringing him back to his father's house in peace, uh, this was just a small part uh, of what he had in mind. He was with him every day of his life he was with him all the way through to eternity uh, as the lord jesus christ taught when asked about the resurrection because uh, here the clear teaching of christ is even when you die god's commitment to you uh, is absolute uh, he was asked about the resurrection and he said now that the dead are raised even moses showed at the bush when he calleth the lord the god of abraham and the god of isaac and the God of Jacob, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Now, clearly, at the time of Jesus, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were asleep in the dust of the earth. Uh, it's clear. Uh, and, and his commentary is one on the resurrection, uh, not on eternal life in heaven. But the resurrection so sure, he says, it's as if they were alive unto God. God's commitment to them hasn't changed one bit because they passed away. So we're seeing here then a God who will not only uh, show Abraham the land in terms of going on a journey with him from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran uh, and down into the land of Canaan. Abraham didn't even know where he was going, we read in, in the book of Hebrews. And his vision, first and foremost, there wasn't for uh, a short-term inheritance uh, in the land before he died. Uh, his vision was for eternal uh, life in the kingdom and to inherit that land forever with his seed. The God who said he would show him the land intends to do that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to set up his glorious kingdom. He showed him the land, of course, in one sense, as he walked with him uh, through it. He was instructed, wasn't he, to walk its length and its, brand, its breadth, but the inheritance comes uh, as that Hebrews passage taught us in the future. As God said to Joshua, as he was about to enter the land, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. This is the commitment of our God. It is resolute. It is unflinching. He will not fail, nor forsake. If we choose 
the pilgrim life, if we are prepared to separate, if we have a vision of faith, our God will show us the land. He will not fail nor forsake as he makes abundantly clear here to Joshua. So there then, brothers and sisters, are the pilgrim principles. We saw them in Genesis 12, verse 1. Uh, we saw them in Hebrews 11, to separate from the spirit of the age, to have a vision uh, of God's heavenly kingdom uh, in which his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign on earth uh, and to walk with God in covenant relationship with him as we head towards that time of blessing. So then in summary, we have, uh, as Joshua laid out for those uh, children of Israel at that time of settling into the land there at the very end of the book, we have a choice. Uh, and this is what Joshua says, you can choose this day who you're going to serve, whether it's the gods which your fathers uh, served that were on the other side of the flood, that was the gods that were ser served uh, by Tira and Abraham and Nahor, uh, or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, we will take the choice uh, of being pilgrims, of walking with God uh, and of having a heavenly vision. So that's the start of our classes together, brothers and sisters. We'll continue to uh, develop these themes as we go into our next class. But now there's time, I believe, for a short break. So look, uh, look forward to being back with you in a few moments. <laughs>